Well, I appreciate all of you uh, being here tonight. I'm sure many of you have heard the uh, saying, what profiteth a man or a woman if they gain the whole world and lose their soul? And perhaps you've reflected on the other, what profiteth a man or a woman if they gain their soul but lose the whole world? So how does one navigate between these tensions of a spiritual life and a worldly life? And when I ponder those kinds of questions, I ask myself other questions like, you know, where was I before I was in this existence, in this lifetime? And why am I here? And what am I? And who am I? And where will I be after I'm no longer here? And in the midst of those types of questions, I decided to write a book, which John told you the title of. And I wrote the book because as a clinical psychologist and as a Jungian analyst and seeing people as a shaman, I listen to many, many stories. And a lot of the stories are happy, but some are sad. But some have themes of being trapped in the story. So I wanted to meditate on that with the people with whom I work, but also to a larger audience. What can you do if you're stuck in your story? How, how might you think about that? Another group for whom I wrote the book were people who are quite spiritual. I mean, they have a spiritual practice. They've had spiritual experiences. But their lives don't necessarily reflect the benefit of the spiritual practices. Their health, their relationships, their psychologies, their jobs. So I wanted to, with that group as well, offer some thoughts as to how one might navigate those questions. And the last group for whom I wrote the book was people who want to be more of service and give back in the world, but just don't feel that they have the energy or the time or they don't know how. So those were the, the groups for whom I wrote the book. And the first step and in some ways, a very difficult step for a person to engage on this process of changing one's story is to be willing to look at actually what your story is. And that's harder than one might think. Because just like when somebody says to you, hey, how you doing? There's a reflect, oh, I'm fine, things are good. We don't often reveal our truth to others, and we often don't reveal it to ourselves. So a first step in changing one's story is to have some idea, honestly, as to what our story is. And so I suggest a series of uh, ways that one might engage their story. You know, first I say, just uh, write a, a gestalt, you know, a few paragraphs. What, what, what's your story? Whatever comes to you. And then, what's your emotional story? If you go back over time, kind of, what are the emotions that seem to be living within you more than others? And then, I say you may be gaining some information if you do it over time, you know, from as far back as you can remember the first 10 years of your life, or maybe where you live someplace, and then the next 10, and the next 10, and the next 10. Just so you start to have different ways of looking at yourself. And then I say, it's useful to break it down into chapters. What's the chapter about your health? Now clearly as we get older, that chapter has different characteristics than when we're younger. But we still have part of our lives worrying and thinking about our health, and our psychologies, our moods, and our significant relationships, and just all of our relationships. If we have kids with our kids, 
with parents, with step parents, with siblings, with friends, with estranged friends. So what's that story? And then the story of our jobs. And if a person is really diligent and honest and looking at themselves just kind of didactically, you get a little bit of a picture. And then if you expand it to the chapter about your relationship to a higher power, how is that working? What's that like? The chapter about are you of service? And then for many people, they have individual chapters which are important to them. How do you relate to money, to power, to spending time, to sexuality? Anybody who writes a story may have particular chapters for them that they like to home in on. I suggest that since we have right sides to our brain and left sides, it's useful to engage our stories in ways other than from our left brain. And that would include, what's the picture of your story? What's the song? What song captures your story? If you're going to write a poem about your story, what's the poem of your story? If somebody else were going to be commenting on your story, what would they say? What would your mom or dad say about your story? Your kids, a good friend, an estranged friend, all as means for you to get a picture of yourself that's as honest as it can be. Shamans, hi, talk about the importance of stalking. And when you're stalking an animal or yourself, you do it really dispassionately. You're very objective. You don't get emotionally tied up into it and judge yourself. Because if you get caught in judging your story and say, gee, I'm a failure. I haven't done this. I should have done that. It's very hard to have the ability to maneuver and change it. Because what all these exercises are for is to help us become more the director of our lives and less a passive actor that other forces are acting on. So once a person has engaged their story and they have a sense of what is, then some themes may start to emerge. And I'll talk more about how those themes work. So you have some themes. One theme of a trap story could be, you know, I can't win for losing. I'm always tired. I'm always there for others, but I don't seem to have others there for me. I listen, 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 but nobody listens to me. Many themes that seem to trap people that they can't seem to get free of, but they're embedded in these larger energies of the stories that I'm, I'm talking about. So once a person has been honest, spent the time, over time to engage themselves and see what is, really what is my life, what is the story of my life, then you start to get glimmerings of how would you like it to be? How would you like your health to be? In all its various dimensions. Your sleep patterns, just your sense of energy, your elimination patterns, how you digest your food, uh, all the things that make up we as physical bodies. And then, how would you like your relationships to be? How would you like your vocation? Or if you're uh, uh, retired or a stay-at-home mom, uh, how would you like that part of your life to be? And then, how would you like your psychology to be, your moods? Would you like to be less depressed, less anxious, less angry? In all these chapters, once you've looked at them and you've said, here's how I'd like it to be, then there's an interesting juncture point. Well, why is it, it the way you would like it to be? You know, when you step back from psychology or spiritual work or anything, you always get to this juncture. There is what is, and there's what you'd like it to be, and then there's the question, well, why haven't you made it the way you would like it to be? What stopped you? And 
there are various answers to that question that people have had. One, now's not the time to make the changes. You know, I've got the kids in the house. I uh, don't have enough money. Uh, when I feel a little better, when I don't have to take care of my parents any longer, a variety of reasons we can give ourselves as to why not to change. But some of those aren't necessarily ultimate limiting factors to keep us from change. I say a limiting factor like if, a, if somebody says, my new story, I'd like to be able to run the 100-yard dash in 10 seconds flat, and you're 45 years old, and you've never exercised. That's just not going to happen. You, you just physically aren't going to do that. But if you say, you know, I'd like to eat a little differently, I'd like to have different interactions with people that I care about, that's something that we can do more about than we think. But what are those factors between what we are and what we like to be that keep us from being how we like to be. And that's where I talk about the shamanic and the Jungian ideas and how one can work with those. And the notion is that sometimes will is just not enough. It's just like on a New Year's resolution. You know, I'm going to do this, this, this. And how often do we keep those? How often does it actually work for us? And shamans and Jungians would say, one of the reasons we're not able to make those changes is that we have some parts of us that don't want to change. As complicated or simple as that. And how can one start to engage those parts? And that's where I talk about these practices that help get to these unconscious determinants of our behavior and practices to work with them so that we can have a new relationship with them, so that we are getting information and energy to allow us to make the changes. Now, some of you may know something about shamanism. How many of you have some familiarity with shamanism? OK. And how about Jungian psychology? OK. They're similar in many ways, because they believe that we have an unconscious set of determinants that live within us and around us that affect us. And it behooves us to have some kind of a relationship with them. And over time, there's kind of a normative idea, there's a good, better, best kind of relationship that each of us determine for ourselves. And the answer is basically, is our life working a little better as a result of these relationships in these various dimensions that I'm talking about? Shamans basically work with energy. They heal. They bring things back from the past, and they work with the future. They believe that spirit, God, is in everything, that we came from some place, I call it the quiet, having visited it in my journeys, the place before creation. This would be the place before there was an idea, the form of the idea, before anything got energized into being. It's the ground. It's the void. It's the Ain Sof. It's all of these. It's the way. It's, it's all of these, these esoteric places energetically from which things spring. And from that place, shamans believe, and Jungians, will, I think, subscribe to this too, that we have this world that we're part of. We have all the visible things in this world, animals, plants. We have all the other worlds that surround us, all of this universe with its vastness, and all the other universes. But the interesting thing is we are in the midst of this quiet, this, this beginning, all the time. It's not like it was 13.6 billion years ago 
It's, we're in the midst of it now. And shamans believe that we can, with our relationship to these places, the quiet, cause things to happen that otherwise wouldn't. It would be the idea of prayer, somehow interacting with the spirit world to cause things to happen that wouldn't. And that requires a right relationship with those realms. In South American shamanism, there's this term called Aini, A-Y-N-I. And it has to do with right relationship, right relationship, right thoughts, right love, right actions. The right thing in the right amount in the right time. And if we have right relationship with these spirit worlds, then we can work with them, not exploit them. Shamans aren't trying to exploit nature, but try to work with nature to have ends that result in ways that please nature, ourselves, and the great spirit. Jungians don't talk as much about that natural world. They're talking about the intrapsychic, the psychic ways in which these things I'm talking about live within us. Carl Jung uh, came up with this concept of the collective unconscious, where the archetypes, these energies that are invisible, can influence how we think, act, and feel. And he feels they're very real. They go across time and they go across cultures and they can, as we speak here, they're influencing us. So part of the practices of Jungian psychology and of shamanism is to come to grips with and find out which of these energies are working within us so that we can have a new relationship to them so that we're able to change our story because we have a new relationship with the energies that may be keeping us from being able to change our stories. So what are some of those practices? How does one do that? In traditional depth psychology, one of the ways to access those places is through dream work. So let's say you have a very powerful dream that seems to be related to some of the things going on in your life. What do you do with that? And I'll come back to talk about that. Shamans believe in dreams as well, but they also believe in accessing these invisible realms through journey work. One of the more popular concepts in shamanism is soul retrieval. And soul retrieval would most typically be seen as a lower world journey. And a lower world journey is going to those places in our past where we've had wounds, we've made deals with life, we've forsaken parts of ourselves that really would like to be with us, but for whatever reason, we're not in access to them, where we may have not come to grips with our instinctual nature, and that's when people in shamanic realms talk about finding your power animal. So there's a journey to go to the lower world to gain information about these energies that may be keeping you from living the story you'd like to live. And during questions, any of those of you who are interested in talking more about that, and if we have time, I'll talk about that further. What, what does that look like? There's also, in the shamanic world, upper world journeys. And the upper world journeys are where you try to hook into a destiny that's more desirable than the one that you're now hooked into so that 
you're making decisions in the present that will enable you to get to that destiny in a more elegant way than you could being in the life path that you now are. And that idea of present decision making is across all esoteric traditions, you know, being in the now, you've heard those, those things. It's all we have is the present. But why don't we make better decisions in the present? And the theory that I'm talking about is because we have past things that we haven't resolved yet that keep us acting in the present in certain patterns, in certain ways, that if we could get free of those past things through psychological work, shamanic work, uh, we can make more free, elegant decisions in the present. But the other thing that, that both traditions talk about is we are tied into a future more than we think, which is influencing us in the present. So if we can be somehow tied into a better future in some consciously intentful way, that's going to allow us to make different decisions than we would in the present had we not been tied into it. So one way to think about psychological, shamanic, any kind of uh, work is to be freed up from your past, have a new relationship with your future so that you make better present decisions. Now, that's easier said than done, but the process is to be more conscious of these factors that are keeping us from doing those things moment to moment that are keeping us stuck. Now, what happens when you encounter a dream image? Back to that, you have this dream image that seems powerful to you or you've encountered in ways you have no idea why it happened, a particular animal on a journey, or a particular aspect of yourself you had no idea was still there. I talk about a process called dialoguing, which is a way to start to relate to these unconscious energies that seem to have a mind of their own that live within us. And sometimes they show up in non-human forms, uh, as an object or an animal, sometimes as humans. And the process that I'm going to describe works because I feel that each of us is a multiplicity of consciousnesses. You know, we have many different sub-personalities. You know, you've read some of the books about people who are multiples. The lesser extreme of that is all of us in this room, because we are all multiples in one way. We can be different ways at different times under different circumstances. That there's a good, better, best way to get in touch with those different parts of ourselves. And one way is what I'm talking about, this dialoguing. So, let's say you're uh, working on an issue of anger. And that's kind of your, your, your journey on, on behalf of getting some insight in your anger so that maybe you can handle it a little bit differently. And you have a squirrel that appears. And so your conscious left brain says, what in the world does a squirrel have to do with my anger? So, this dialoguing process is based on the idea that since that image came to you, it somehow is related to you, some part of you, but it has a mind of its own. And I'm saying, having seen it many, many times, it's possible to find out what that squirrel energy has to tell you. And the way in which you do it is you first in kind of a mechanical way. You might, one example and one way that many people do it, you get a stone and you blow into that stone the energy of the squirrel that you encountered on your dream or your journey. So now, in some energetic way, the energy of that is there as it's come through you. And you ask it, you know, what can you tell me about my anger? And then you go over 
You pick up the stone, take a breath, and your ego, you over here is ask this squirrel part of you, but then you become the squirrel. And this is the part that most people are a little awkward at in the beginning, because you don't really believe that you can be split in these two ways. But here's where it gets so amazing when people have done this. You let the squirrel answer. What can you tell me about the answer? And if you can get past your self-consciousness, all of a sudden things can come out that you had no idea were there. But you have to be able in this process to start to remember, because you're many parts, you have one, this part that's speaking to you that in the past you've never really listened to before, speaking to this conscious part of you that is wondering about the questions. So this part has to listen while this part is talking. And then after this part has talked, you come back over here having listened to it, and you respond. And then you have a dialogue. So you start to learn when you do this, you are of many parts. These symbols and inner figures and images that come to you are not coincidental. They're very meaningful, and they have information. And by working with them, you can become free of some of these unconscious things that are keeping you from changing your story. That's the, the idea. So this is one practice. I'll talk about some other ones, too. And when you do this practice, you'll start to see there's even a third energy in the room. There's you, your consciousness. There's the thing that you're interacting with. And then there is let's call it a witness consciousness, there's something that's observing the whole thing going on. Uh, so you have many parts, you're observing it, you're trying to make sense of it, all for the purpose of seeing, do you want to be doing something different in your life tomorrow, in the next hour, than you have been as a result of this new energy and this new information? That's what it's all about. But again, it goes back to, are you happy with your life? And if you're not, how would you like to change it? And why haven't you been able to change it? And here's some ways to get energy and information to make the changes. Now, when you're going to do these practices, I really believe it's important to set the stage. Just as I said in the beginning, uh, this interaction between our spiritual natures and our physical, earthly natures is a complex one. But if we can respect the complexity and honor the spiritual and prepare ourselves for encountering it, I think we can enhance the possibilities of our being able to have a meaningful relationship with it. Now, how does one do that? In the shamanic realm, one way you do it is you call in the energies to help create a sacred space. In one level, we're in the midst of sacred space all the time. But we know that that by itself isn't necessarily going to cause our lives to change. With our intent, we invite it in to work with us, because then we start to establish this idea that we do have the ability in this lifetime to co-create a life. Co-create, not with our ego, make things happen. We've seen that that doesn't usually work. That's why people who don't relate to these invisible worlds sometimes get stuck. And yet, if you just travel in the invisible worlds without taking a stand vis-a-vis uh, -vis them, that doesn't often work either. So what's the elegant way to be with these energies to work with them, well, one way is to respect that they're around and call them in from whatever tradition you have. In different shamanic works, they talk about the, the qualities and the energies of the various directions, above and below. In all the esoteric, mystical traditions, you might have heard this word correspondences. So there's a correspondence between a direction, a gemstone, an energy, a psychological a attribute, an animal, a flower. And so people will call on the energetic essence of those things in order to work with them for a particular cause or particular 
purpose that they have. So when you're opening the sacred space and calling in these directions, that's a start. And then if you could start to remember that we're, we're, we have an energy body, you know, we are just congealed in some ways energy. We just happen to have a, a vibration that's a little uh, less fast than things that are more invisible. But we have energy bodies that impact our physical bodies, our psychological bodies, our spiritual bodies. And if we can cleanse that energy body through various practices, including our intent to cleanse it, and I talk more about that in some of you know, my writing, that's a good start to heal and to make change, just to cleanse our energy bodies. And then lastly, to quiet our minds, and I'm sure many of you, or most of you, have done meditative practices, but to have that no mind, it changes physiologically the brain waves. It switches the processing more from the frontal lobes back to the hind brain, where there is more integrative processing, they say. And change can take place when we're in this cleansed space, in sacred space, where our breathing has caused us to be calmer and reflective. It's a, it's a, a nice place from which to do the work. And what's the work? The work could be journey work, working with our dreams, and also working with nature. I believe that one of the most powerful transformative agents for any of us is spending time in nature, around water, flowers, plants, animals, and letting, starting to have the feeling that just as we are observing nature, nature is observing us, that we have this, this reciprocal relationship with it. Some years ago, I was at a conference. It was uh, by uh, Jung and the Theology. It was up in Evanston. And they had some very big names, you know, theologians and people who wrote about this stuff, you know, talking. And it, it was pretty heady. It was pretty heady stuff. Uh, and there was a certain energy in the group as people were talking about it. But then a couple of the speakers started to talk about times in their own life when they'd been in nature. You know, they were, you know, at a camp or this. Uh, the whole energy, their demeanor changed. They just kind of got, you know, just <laughs> different. And the audience, it was just, it was amazing. And this is just talking about it. <laughs> and just ask yourselves, what's it been like for you sometimes to have a meaningful time on a lake, at a sunset, at a sunrise? It could be very hard to describe it, but very powerful. So spending time in nature with some intentionality can be very healing and help one change one's story in ways that you can't even imagine. Doing ceremony and ritual. And I talk about some South American rituals that are very powerful. Doing fire ceremonies, a fire ceremony where you're using the energy of the fire to help make change in things that are going on within you, where you go to a fire and say, uh, in a ritual way, I want to put something into the fire that I'd like to uh, get rid of. I'll put something into the fire I'd like to gain, uh, something into the fire to help me gain balance. And then lastly, and this is very true of uh, most shamanic traditions, what can I put into the fire for the good of the all? This is for the, for the collective. So there's always, uh, in those traditions, it's not just what can you do for me, but I want to express appreciation to all that you've done for, for me. So it's, it's, it's a practice of gratitude. Some of the journeys that I talk about in my book are journeys to this place before creation and what you can do when you get there. Journeys to the matrix, which is this energetic connection of all that was, is, and ever will be to the lower world, which I described, to the upper world, to death, the idea that death is a very, very powerful 
energy that it behooves us to relate to while we're alive and have some peace with it. So look at your life, look at your stories. What would you like them to be? Do practices to interact with the invisible, unconscious factors that are keeping you from doing them. I'm mentioning some that get you to the transpersonal world, but a person can get there through yoga, through Qigong, through Tai Chi, through meditation. These are just the practices that I think work, and I try to give examples for people who use them. So I'm going to pause now and answer any questions. And if anybody has uh, tried to change their story and uh, uh, has had problems doing so, <laughs> we can talk about that. So any, any question about any of the things that I've talked about that somebody would like to, uh, to, to raise? I, I don't know if this is a question, but it, it relates somehow. Uh, just last night, I got out the 12 steps of AA, and uh, I, I've never done them, but I knew them, and I had a reason why I thought it might benefit me to, to do this. I wanted to write to my sister. I wanted to write an apology to my sister. That's why I wanted to do this. So, so I thought it would help me, and, and I got, okay, the first part is, I can't run my life by myself, that there's higher powers, and I can, I can do that. But then, then I got to the part about you, you do a, a fearless, fearless and something uh, analysis of your moral self, of your moral life. And I couldn't, I was surprised, I couldn't do this. I thought, that's, it's all based on shoulds. And uh, it just didn't seem to work. I don't know how that relates to what you're saying, but I, I, wanted to, I wanted to look at my life differently. You know, I wanted to look at my life more objectively. I guess this was a left brain thing. Maybe that was the problem, that it, my left brain was supposed to judge my life. And I think what you're talking about is letting letting your subconscious speak to you, or something more organic, yes. letting it arise, or... Y yes. Is that right? Yes. The, something, the, something has to, uh, and I'll call it the left brain of the ego, has to take a stand. Uh, sometimes we have difficulty taking a stand because of words that trigger stuff in us. I'm not sure if the word should triggered something in you. Should is not in it, but it says you do a moral, a moral analysis of your life, or, or an analysis of your mm -hmm. moral life, or something. Yes. And, I, and, and I guess that word, to me, it, I couldn't work with it. Okay. And so that's interesting. That's just data. You know, from a, the standpoint of what we're talking about, that's not good or bad, other than you found out you got stuck in this process by, because of that. And that's something that you could work around. You know, you could journey on behalf of that. You can let spirit inform you. You can go into nature and say, isn't this interesting? I, I want to do this practice, but I got stuck right here. And why is that? Not judging it, not good or bad, it just is. And so just that fact that you were honest enough to say, yeah, I got stuck here, a lot of people wouldn't. They just kind of go on, oh, I don't want to do this. You know, it's uncomfortable. So you, you already are moving into it. Uh, and, and you got an entry point. I got what? An entry point. An entry, entry. A point to enter in. Oh. An entry point. So what, what, what should I do with this? Uh, <laughs> 17 things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You dialogue with a word? Yeah, I mean, what, what? What is what's what's the what's what was the feeling that came up when you got stuck? Uh, judgment, it, it, like it's all about judgment. It, it's not a kind approach. I I feel like in my life I've tried hard, and and if I failed, I'm trying to look at at that. But uh, there's something. It's about will. It's, it's, it's some ideas that 
that I could, I could see what I did wrong and change it. And uh, I don't, I guess I, I guess I have never had much luck with that. Uh, would, would it be fair to say that, that words like judgment have a resonance within you? Yes. Being judged? Yes. Judging others? Probably. Okay. Uh, shoulds? Shoulds. It's oh. a terrible word. Okay. So those are all rich places to go. So you could say, I'm not saying this, but you know, a person that would say, say what you said, may be one of the themes in your life that somehow yet to be determined that's kept you from being as fluid as you would like would be your feelings around those words. Oh, uh-huh. Would that uh -huh. be possible? Yeah, a theme in my life. I, uh, yeah, a theme. Okay. All right, mm -hmm. so if a person can see the theme and where it comes from, mm -hmm. you can start to unravel it. And, and, and here's, let me back up for something. The, the, the kind of things we're talking about, most of us, you know, my age, lived hundreds of thousands of hours. And the idea that, you know, in, in five or 10 or 20 hours, we can undo it, it's amazing. I mean, it's amazing what you can do with it relatively, uh, in terms of a life, uh, hours. But it's, it, it's possible because I think spirit is working with us. You know, we, ha we have some helpers, but we have to do our, our part of it. And part of it is to just be honest, just like you were, you know, and to publicly talk about those things. A lot of people can't, but even to yourself, and now you have some things to work with. You can dialogue with those words. You can kind of meditate on it. And you can say, you know what? How, how, how have judgments played out in my life? You sit in the park. You, just, you let it just kind of inform you without necessarily trying to do too much with it too soon. And then the changes that we can make are just at the margin. It's just a little, little change here, a little change there. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to bed a little different. The next time I'm in a situation, I may respond a little differently. I'm going to notice the tone of my voice. I'm going to notice when I get kind of triggered down here. You're just changing little things, and all of a sudden, those little changes can result in a lot bigger changes than you think. And how do you know? This is all the beauty of this kind of work. It's all self-referential. You know because you tell yourself. You're not going to an expert. You're not going to a doctor. You're not going to, you know, it's like, you, you, you do this yourself, and then you judge for yourself, is it working? Now, you can say, can I really be objective about it? Can I really tell, can I look at myself honestly? Well, that's a good question. But in the final analysis, you know, who, who better? In the final analysis, who knows is better than ourselves at a very, very deep level? Now, can we kid ourselves, and do we have a lot of hang-ups about this idea? Of course we do. But it, it, it's possible to make incremental changes that can result in bigger changes. Another question? I'm wondering how you personally got involved with exploring um, yourself through the more shamanistic modes and recognizing the aid of, of something like spirit. Uh, I grew up in, uh, you know, my, my, I was a product of my era and a product of my family. And uh, my dad was in the steel business. I lived in uh, Pittsburgh, Gary in Pittsburgh. And I worked summers in the, uh, the mills. Uh, and in my family, uh, success was basically Achievement, you know, did good in sports, you did good in school, uh, you got a good job, you, you know, you got married, and uh, that was kind of it. I mean, you know, there, were, there, were, there wasn't a whole lot of soulful thought about that. And I was in that trajectory, and I uh, did that. And so my, my life up to a point was trying to achieve those things academically, in sports, and eventually in business. But there was part of me that wasn't really fed. And the first move that I made to get fed was to go into psychology. So I was still doing my other stuff, business things, but then I went into <laughs> psychology. And then I got a chance to uh, express a lifelong interest in shamanism. I don't know where that came from, but I was, was, was interested in it. And I did some studying, you know, maybe 15 years ago. 
And it became a very, very full entry point for me to connect to these energies that I'm talking about, where I actually was able to do it. And those connections have been with me ever since and have been really a very important part of my life. So it was just kind of muddling through. You know, I came from a traditional kind of a background and then I broke out of it a little bit and then the shamanic world gave me, you know, I mean, it's certainly not been a cure-all, but it's given me more freedom and flexibility in my life than I had before I got on that path. Um, what are the lower realms that you were talking about? One, uh, one journey, and, and this is a journey that uh, I've, I've adopted from uh, things that Alberto Viotto has done. Uh, you, you're wanting to go to the lower world to see uh, what effects your family of origin unconsciously might have had on you. And also, uh, maybe your karmic. If you believe in past lives, you know, what past lives you might have had that are impacting you. And uh, this particular journey, you go to a place in nature that's very pleasing to you. You then go down through the topsoil, through the bedrock, into an underground cavern where there's water. You go to a garden-like place. You meet a guide. And one of the interesting things is when you do this work, you want to be really respectful of these places and ask, is it a good day to journey? So if you are going to journey, the first place you go to in this particular journey, lower world, is the chamber of wounds. So you go into this place and you look. You don't make judgments, you just see what's there. And it's amazing what different people experience. So you go into this chamber of wounds and you just see, just with those words, wounds, what appears, who's there, what's there. You, know, you get a sense of how you feel about it. You don't have to stay too, too long there, but you're just getting a, a picture. The next place is the chamber of contracts. And this would be a place where you get a picture. What's the deal you've made with life? And an example of a deal would be, you know, I'm going to be nice to people so they're nice to me. I don't, I don't want to really become visible so I don't get hurt. And so there's a lot of different deals that we make. Sometimes we're not conscious of them. But if you're down there with the intent, you have the spirit world helping you, it's amazing what you see. Then when you have that particular image, then you can say, would you like to have a new contract? Would you like to have a new, new deal? Recognizing that a contract has two parts. I'm going to do this in order to get that. Uh, so that's one chamber. Then the next one would be this place that's called the Chamber of Grace or the Chamber of Passions. This would be that part of you that never left the garden, never left the Edeni garden, that is very powerful, soulful, if you can get in touch with it. You know, and, and so, uh, you know, a doctor, a woman doctor was uh, doing this journey and she encountered a, a cowgirl, you know? And so she, she related to the, to the cowgirl and, and, got, you know, and got really back in touch with, you know, she lost that part of herself. She just lost that part of herself, you know? And, and that, that part had, had really meaning to her. So she worked with that. And then there's a process, do you want to bring that energy back with you? And how do you do it? And how does that live within you then? How are you going to honor that energy, that cowgirl energy, or the dancer? Or another guy was just saw him fishing on a bank. You know, how do you bring those energies back in? And there's a process to that. The next chamber is called the Chamber of Gifts. And this is where you get some everyday object that you can bring into your life to re remind you of what you found down there. And you have a process to interact with that, dialoguing with it. And then the last thing you do in this lower world, this particular journey, you sit very quietly and you become aware that something's coming up from behind you. And you turn around and you see your power animal. Now it can be a bird, it can be, and you ask, what message, you know the questions that I suggest people, what message do you have for me? And then the next question is, what do you want from me? And then you can ask it what you want from it, you can dialogue with it, you know, you know I'd like to get some of this or some of that. And the last, question that's slightly different than what you want from me. I say to this, whatever it is, what can I do for you? This is, you know, this right relation. What can I do for you? Mm -hmm. It's like when you, when you do a lot of, uh, uh, you know, some, some people, you know, do the plant work with ayahuasca and things, things like that. One of the uh, things, uh, these would be the plant, psych psychotropic uh, plants. You know, you, they, they usually say, uh, cleanse me, heal me, teach me, 
But the last thing is, what, what can you do for the plant? So in all these experiences, you could, you could really be saying, you know, cleanse me, heal me, teach me, and what can I do for you? So there's that. So that would be a lower world journey. Yes? Um, maybe this is in the book, and I'm going to find this out. But do you have any suggestions uh, over time? You know, there's been times when I've gotten involved in different shamanic stuff, and I'm going to do a journey. And, you know, I just, you know, my whimsical mind and my analytical mind are always, like, both engaged. And as soon as my analytical mind comes in, I, like, lose it. And, um, you know, it might be saying, oh, you're going, you know, through this hole in the ground, and I'm in this great place, and I'm kind of clipping along, and then all of a sudden I'm like, well, am I going like this, or am I, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Like, I, sure, I sure. just completely, and then I can't get back on track, and if I'm mm -hmm. listening to somebody who's trying to take me on a journey, I they go too fast. Yep. So, have you got any advice about that? Uh, yeah, I have some, uh, some observations about it. Um, if there's a group like this, uh, and, uh, you know, bigger groups, and I, I take people on a journey, uh, if people are honest, maybe half of them actually journey. And the other half who don't journey on this first time, a lot of times it's amazing, uh, initially in workshops, how many times people are just exhausted, you know, they come, they're tired, they go to sleep. I mean, actually, they go to sleep during the journey. They're, 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 they're beat. <laughs> Uh, another thing, they'll have all of a sudden that something really uncanny, you know, th will happen. Uh, and they'll say, I'm making this up, you know, I'm making this up. And then they discount it. And so they pretend that it didn't, it didn't happen. Uh, so there's a variety of reasons that people have for not doing it. Or I just can't do it. I go into these chambers, it's empty. Go in the next one, it's empty. But each of them, each of the experiences has information, just like, you know, judgment. Should. It's all information. It's empty. You dialogue with the emptiness. And I have never seen a situation where a person who hasn't kept at it that hasn't got a very meaningful thing from it. But now, does it mean that you do it in the sixth time or the second time or the eighth time? And I say keep at it. I mean, it's not like doing it for years, but it's just if you keep at it, something will happen. And if you note, yeah, I have a, I have a tendency to uh, second guess myself. Uh, and then you can say, do I do that in other areas of my life? And am I trying to you know, pre-plan stuff? And so there's a, a theme, maybe. I'm not saying that there is, but if there, if there is, then you can work with that theme. And then one journey gives you a hint that's going to help you with the dream, which is going to help you with working on the 12 steps. And all of a sudden, starts, stuff starts to shift a little bit. And all of a sudden, you get a, a little, maybe a big, aha moment. So if you're patient with yourself, and you note it, and you say, I'm either not going to do it anymore, but you still may do it. Say, all right, this is interesting. Now, now I'm in this place. I'm looking from, from this up. I'm going to just, what do I see? Now, and may, maybe the journey's calling you to look at it from like this. You don't judge it, but you just see, what do you see? Maybe you need to change your perspective. I'm just making that up. So there's a lot of, it's all, it's all rich. It's all data. Is it only me that can detect a power animal, or can someone else actually detect one for you? Uh, traditionally, you know, when shamans, uh, you go to see a shaman a lot of times, they will journey on your behalf. And so they will uh, tell you what they saw in your chamber of wounds. They will, you know, tell you what the, your contract is. They'll see this place, and they'll, they'll see this is your power animal. Yeah. Uh, so that's one way, you know, and you know, some people see things that are useful for the person with whom they're working. But if we have all of the archetypes living within us, in a way, then we all have the inner healer, the inner shaman, uh, and so we can journey for ourselves, and we can, we can do that for ourselves. Now, it's interesting. I remember <laughs> when I was uh, training uh, you know, in soul retrieval, uh, lower world journeys. You know, we would, over the course of a you know, week, we might do 10 journeys. And people would think that once you've done one, isn't that determinative? Isn't that all you need to do? And I, you know, why do you keep doing them? And, and, but you keep getting nuances or different things and so forth. And an interesting this question is, uh, 
does what the shaman find for you the same as what you find? Or is it energetically kind of the same? And the thing is, I don't think it makes a whole lot of difference because we project onto whatever it is what we need to. And you work with it however you need to. I, I, was, um, I, I was up in Canada not so long ago, and we were, it was a group like this, and we were, we were talking. And uh, we got into, uh, uh, is anybody wanting to change their story and having trouble doing it? You know, you, I want to, but I can't. And, and what are some of the reasons why we can't? And one, <laughs> somebody being very honest was, I want to change my story, but I kind of like the drama. I don't want to give up the drama. <laughs> yeah. you know, that was kind of, you know, very honest. I, I, I like the drama, the one that I have. It's not working real well, but I like the drama. Uh, and and another, another person said, uh, it's fear that uh, if I am no longer who I have been, people in my life are not going to be there for me anymore. Now, that's a very real thing. If you're no longer who I've been, you know, I'm not going to have the people in my life there with me and for me. That's a conundrum. So does that mean that I really can't be who I am uh, for fear of losing somebody who doesn't want me to be who I am? Well, that's an existential dilemma that has many ramifications, but one that one needs to be honest about, and that's one of the obstacles that people find for making change. Because one of the ideas in shamanism is, as we do this work for ourselves, there's a ripple effect on everybody in our lives, including, if you do it for yourself, people who are no longer alive. And that's where you start to believe that you know, the past, the present, the future are all kind of interacting. So you do your work, and you come to peace at some level a little differently than you had before. It's amazing what can happen, the work that you do yourself, if you believe that we're all connected and that you know, we go to some place that we came from. Your dead parents, your dead friends can be affected by our work. I'm thinking that names hold us in the past. And I think in, in some native traditions, people change their names as they, as they go through life. And uh, I, 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 I changed my name somewhere there in my college years. But it was difficult for my family and the, the people who I grew up with to make that change with me and to stay with me in that. And some did and some didn't. And some still call me by my earlier name. And uh, I get confused about it myself. You sure. know? But, but uh, I don't know. It's just an observation, I guess, that changing our names as we go through life can be helpful, right? If you can really live the new name and let go of the old one. Now, even if you can't, it's an interesting experiment. But you're also, I think, suggesting the power of words and the power of words that uh, how we talk to ourselves. You know, when you're telling the story, just the way we, we, we name it. Remember, you know, in the, I think it's in John, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So the Word is really important. And the words that we use to describe our stories we can start to identify with them, you know? And, and so can you let the words go and change them and use different words? And if you do just like different names, it can be liberating. Instead of calling something, you know, I'm uh, uh, always swimming, you know, having the image, I'm always swimming against the current. You know, I, I've had people say, you know, sometimes, uh, this is an interesting, just an aside, you know, people will start to talk about some of their metaphors. And one is, I'm slogging through quicksand. And I've never felt that. I'm just, I just, you know, my, I just can't get any traction. Uh, so how can you have a different image of that? Or I'm swimming against the current. How can you kind of go with the current and let it take you where it's going to? And then when it's a little weaker, it's like with a riptide. Then you kind of get out of it, and then you go where you need to go. So you just change your thought energetically of how you want to relate to something. 
And it's amazing how that little shift can have other shifts in other aspects of your life, just like new words, new names. When you were talking of, about dialoguing with an animal, about your anger, and then uh, having that objective part of yourself, um, is that objective part of yourself able to take then the, the dialogue as well as have more of a, like a vantage point maybe up here from what was going on? <laughs> yeah, that's that's very confusing, and <laughs> yeah, and, and and it's a little like you know the, your analytical mind. You know, how am I supposed to do this right? And um, it's hard to describe a process like this really usefully in a lot of words. And so, but it's kind of like what I'm saying. And when you experiment with it and do it, it'll start to become more clear. In other words, you you actually have some part of yourself in in the the payoff is when you actually have allowed yourself to become, in this example that I gave, you know, the squirrel, and, and assess something that you just, your conscious mind wouldn't have said. And then you're starting, you're pondering it here, and you say, well, gee, what, what use can I make of this life? What, what, am, I, what am I learning about the way I am? Um, in a, a woman one time in a, in a workshop had a, a picture of a porcupine. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people, uh, uh, in fact, it was a power animal. And, and sometimes people uh, have these images, they don't like what they get. They say, I don't want a, another woman had a mouse. I don't want a mouse, I want a tiger, I want a lion. And, you, know, I, you know, I don't want a, a, little, a little thing. But she had a porcupine. And, and she really had a reaction to it. You know, it was just, you know, uh, I'm, you know, I, I'm just, I have a lot of prickly people in my life. I have a lot of, so she was really angry about that image and she was working with it. And then all of a sudden, this huge shift she saw how she was sometimes prickly, and she was, but she didn't want to see that. And that gets into uh, languaging again, which I talk about in the, in the book. I use some Jungian language to help understand these energies we get, like shadow and persona and you know, conscious sexual opposites and complexes and, and different types of archety arch archetypes to help understand it. But in this case, prickliness she saw it in others, but she didn't see it in herself. Mm -hmm. But this allowed her to see it, and that aspect of owning her prickliness was a small step, but a big one, in helping her shift from one story to the next. Because she was dead set, she didn't want to admit some of the determinants that were keeping her from living a new story. Can you tell us something about your experiences in Peru and how that came about? Um, I went uh, to Peru, I think it was about 14 years ago, first time, with a, uh, a group, a, a shaman group. And uh, we spent some time in the jungle, and we spent some time in the mountains. And I've gone down a few more times, uh, a couple more times with groups, but since then I've met some shamans. So I'll go down there by myself, and maybe with shamans who are friends, we'll do some work together. And I've gone down now maybe you know, 10, 11 times. And uh, I'll go in the mountains and sometimes in the jungles. And there's just different energies in both places. Very powerful. Uh, the people that I've been with, uh, I'll either have uh, interpreters, because I don't speak Spanish. Uh, some of them speak Quechua, which is the uh, indigenous language uh, down there. Uh, but some of the people I know can speak English uh, as well. And there's a lot of very, very powerful spiritual people that they're not, uh, not on the circuit that are just really fun to be with and just it's, we, we do work together. I also spent some time in Canada. One of my good friends is a Blackfoot elder. And so the, the interaction between the North American and the South American you know, shamanic traditions is, uh, is interesting. And I spent time uh, with shamans in Australia and Outer Mongolia and Ethiopia. And one of the things that I found is that there's, uh, uh, at, at core, a real similarity uh, amongst all of them in terms of their worldview. You know, this idea of the quiet that everything came from it. They may not articulate it exactly like that, but that's what they believe. They believe that we do have the ability to co-create, to make things, things happen. They spend a lot of time working with nature, and they have their own particular power animals or you know, things that they would, 
would work with. Do, does this have any similarity with witchcraft? Uh, I, I'm not that familiar with witchcraft, uh, you know, as a as a science. But if it's working, if it's working with the invisible realms, uh, completely. But uh, witchcraft, sorcery, shamanism, all have different connotations. And so the question is, is it white magic, black magic, or gray magic? White magic would be you're doing work with somebody that, who has asked you to, to do it you know, for, for their good. Gray magic is you're working on somebody that you haven't been asked to. You think it's in their good. And that would almost be like praying for somebody who's sick. Uh, I'm not judging it one way or another. That would be gray magic. Black magic would be you're doing something to hurt somebody. Now, I don't know enough about Wicca and witchcraft. I'm sure there are many you know, people who practice witchcraft who, who do it for good, you know, to, to help the... Uh, the collective to help uh, uh, animals, to help the environment, to help Mother Earth. But I, yes, they're similar, I think, in, in that they believe there is an invisible realm that we can relate to. The same, you know, the fairy, the fairy world in the, in the Celtic traditions and the Druids uh, would have those types of beliefs as well. Do you, do you feel um, <clears throat> that um, this planet, that with all the consciousness what's happening right now, that we're going to go through some change of, uh, I don't know, I guess that, that's, I'm reflecting what I feel. Like, uh, you, you feel that? Yes. Like, like we're coming to something or, you know, some sort of a change in consciousness. Yes. Uh, I, I do. Uh, I don't know how much it's because, you know, I've heard that. I don't know how much because, you know, with, with the, uh, uh, the news, you know, you see all this, you know, the turmoil and the, and the, and the conflict. I don't know. Uh, but down deep, I think we're moving faster towards something yeah. than we have been. But I don't have enough frame of reference for having, you know, lived in, in other eons. But I think, I think something is happening energetically that uh, it behooves us to, to somehow have a better relationship with these energies than we have yeah. in order to prepare for it. And also to prepare for changing our stories while we're alive in this lifetime yeah. to have it more pleasing to ourselves in spirit. So I, I would think that's true. I was just curious what your power animal is. <laughs> I have a collection. <laughs> uh, one of uh, you know all, all South American shamans want to say they have jaguars, but uh, I have a collection of <laughs> jaguars. But also uh, eagle is one, elephant, turtle, turkey. <laughs> So I, I have a, I have a, a few.